Uh, most employers will at some point uh, engage in some sort of performance review with you. If you haven't gone through the experience, uh, you will. And if, uh, if you do, you'll find it, it certainly be met with a certain measure of stress and anxiety. Uh, such comments that are made in a performance review should be kept in confidence. But here's some examples of some actual statements made in performance reviews that I want to share with you today. So here's some. Uh, since my last report, this employee has reached rock bottom and started to dig. Uh, here's another. Works well when under constant supervision and cornered like a rat in a trap. Uh, this young lady has delusions of adequacy. This employee is depriving a village somewhere of an idiot. <laughs> somebody actually wrote that down in somebody's report. Got a full six pack but lacks the plastic fee that holds it all together. If you see two people and one looks bored, he's the other one. Gates are down, lights are flashing, but the train isn't coming. <laughs> if you stand close enough to him, you can hear the ocean. <laughs> Some drink from the fountain of knowledge, he only gargled. And then the wheel is turning, but the hamster is dead. That would sound, we had hamsters for our kids. And I remember crying with our kids, but they were crying, we were burying our hamsters a sad day. But evaluations really are critical because they help us. Yeah. These are intended to help us. We need to receive with a, with a spirit of humility. But it's a necessary experience because sometimes we, we fall into the trap of self-deception and we believe our own press releases. And we all have blind spots. And even the sleek assassins in the movies have blind spots. Because sometimes what, you're, what your eye is telling the brain isn't completely accurate. There are limitations for all of us. And then there's, of course, a, there's that metaphorical blind spot, those personality quirks, those, those relating styles, those sinful behaviors, which we've engaged in so long that they've become a part of us and we no longer see them. And last week we talked about 1 Timothy 4.2 and how, how we can actually have our conscience seared, cauterized. And our brain will create new ruts of thinking. And we just get so used to it that we don't see the shortcomings. And sometimes we need somebody to come alongside and say, Hey, knucklehead, wake up! So what Amos is to Israel is in many ways a performance review, God's performance review. It's a wake up. Look at your, your blaring blind spots and how they're ruining you, and how you are on a path of self-destruction. And so that's what, in many ways, Amos is about, as Amos speaks to Israel in a very specific historic time, but there are transferable principles, the things we learn about God and about ourselves that we can find an application. So turn to Amos, and let's look at chapter 3. Chapter 3, where it says, Hear this word, and, and he begins to zero in his message to Israel, and he gives five particular messages or themes. The first three all start with is hear this word, and the last two starts with a woe. But here, beginning of five messages or sermons, hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family. And so while most of Amos is addressing the northern tribes, and some of his message is addressing surrounding nations. Here, he, he does speak about historic Israel. The whole family. The whole family says, that I brought up out of the land of Egypt, prior to the separation of Judah and Israel. You only have I known. Of all the families of the earth, therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. What, what, what he's saying here, this is the focus really, because he's saying to you, you've committed the sin of, the sin of presumption, the sin of irresponsibility, the sin of neglect, the, the sin of squandered stewardship, because you had a very particular blessing. I revealed myself to you. I showed myself to you. I disclosed myself to you. And with that came responsibility. And so as you read in the history of Israel is, is God calls Abraham out of the earth of the Chaldees. And he's using Abraham to create a new nation, new people that 
he will have a particular relationship with it, he anticipates will be a witness to the nations of the world. And so he protects Abraham. And he protects them from external forces. And he protects the patriarchs from an internal, internal argument and internal dissension. And he protects them when, he, when they face famine. He takes them to Egypt, and when they go to Egypt, he protects them and allows them to flourish and prosper, and even as, as oppression mounts and as pressure is put in, God protects them. And then he leads them out of Egypt and into a land of hope, a land of opportunity, a land of promise. And there in that new land, he gives them a more fuller disclosure of his will and his ways in the, in the commandments of God. And, and God is developing and fostering a relationship with this community, with this people. Because he wants them to be a testimony and a light to the nations of the world. So that other nations would look at Israel and say, wow, wouldn't it be great if we could have what that people group has, what that nation has, what that community has. And missions has always been the objective of God. And so while Israel was the apple of God's eye and a very unique, distinct relationship that he had with they were intended to be ambassadors and representatives and a, and a witness, missionaries really, to the world. And he says to them, I gave you my will, I gave you my word, I gave you revelation, I gave you the law, I gave you the Torah, I gave, I gave you the Bible, and I sent you kings and priests and prophets to keep you on track. You had so much, you had knowledge, you had wisdom, you had truth. You turned your back. And we know there's this overarching principle of life, too much is given, much is required. Here, they had been given truth and they said no. They squandered it. The next segment of the chapter, you can read it on your own. There are a number of rhetorical questions that are asked. All linking Israel in its relationship with God. And then he asks, if you take, if we take you to the for fortresses of Ashdod, to Philistia, if I take you to the, to the fortresses of Egypt, and there from the vantage point of, of, of Ashdod and, and Egypt, and we look at Israel and say, look at Israel, what would they see? They would see a nation that's far more degenerated than even Egypt and Ashdod. And he says in verse 11, chapter 3, he says, therefore, thus says the Lord God, an adversary, an adversary shall surround the land and bring down your defenses from you, and your strongholds shall be plundered. And we know that in 722, their national identity evaporated when the Assyrians destroyed what was once so glorious. He rebukes them. He says, you had, you had knowledge. You had truth. You had me. And and you squandered it. You rejected it. You had to have it your way. Chapter 4 is a, a new message. And here he cites some different issues. So in chapter 4, hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on, mountain, on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring that we may drink. Well, here he talks about these cows of Bashan. What are these cows? Or who are these cows of Bashan? Well, Bashan was the land east of Jordan. It was famous for some hundred kilometers of, of lush, fertile land. Grazing fields for cows. The cows there in Bashan were fat and, and healthy and, and made delicious steaks. And, and, and he's referencing these cows of Bashan. Who's he referring to? Terribly politically incorrect. But he's referring to these prosperous, wealthy, upper-class women who, the text says, were actually harassing and abusing and manipulating the poor so they could have their perks, their benefits, their lush, extravagant, opulent lifestyle. And these cows of Bashans went to their husbands and it's an interesting word. It's not the normal word for husband here. It's, it's the word master. And, and I, I think Amos is dripping with sarcasm here. Because here he's saying these, these, these women, these prosperous women who are abusing the poor,
with excessive debt rates and, and putting them into slavery for the smallest of, of financial responsibilities. And they were going to their husbands and saying, Master, Master, you need to bring in some more because we want to buy some good wine. And I know men can have a strong influence over their wives, but wives can have a very strong influence over their husbands. And that was the case at this particular juncture. And God rebukes them, verse 2 and 3. He says, The Lord has sworn by His holiness that, that behold, the days are coming upon you when they shall take you away with hooks, meat hooks, really. Even the last of you with fish hooks. You shall go out through the breaches, each one of you ahead, and, and you shall be cast into harmony, declares the Lord, looking to the time when the Assyrians would take them, in, in some cases, literally on hooks, looking forward to the brutality that the Assyrians would bring onto them. But verse 4 and 5, he says, has come to Bethel and transgress, to Gilgal and multiply transgressions. But bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving of that which is leavened and proclaim free will offerings. Publish them, for so you love to do, O people of Israel, declares the Lord. And here what he's citing, not only, not only the, the horrendous treatment of the poor and the marginalized for their own advantage, but now he cites the hypocrisy of their religion. And he says, you, you, you go to Bethel, the chief sanctuary of the north, and you go to Gilgal, where the memorial stones mark Israel's entrance in the land existed. And you, you tithe, and you offer offerings, and you do so to impress one another. And your worship is all about yourself. Your worship is somehow about self-promotion, advancing your own reputation, advancing public opinion, has nothing to do with me. In fact, it's in, in stark, dramatic, antithetical contrast to everything that worship should be. How far you have drifted. This cannot, it cannot go on. The next segment of chapter 4, verses 6 to 11, God assures him that there will be consequences. In fact, what he does in that chapter, and again, because of time, we won't look at it, but in, in this sec section, he talks about how he sent them actually natural disasters. And those natural disasters were intended to awaken their sensitivities. Sometimes, sometimes, God sends natural disasters to arouse our sensitivities, to awaken us to our reality. And for each of these five references that God makes in this paragraph, each one is met with, yet you did not return me. I, I sent you this calamity, and you didn't return me. And I sent you this calamity, and you refused to return me. And I sent you this calamity, and you would not open your eyes. Your blind spots were so glaring, it had to be your way. I gave you myself and my word and my truth, and you turned your back on it. And I invite you to worship me, the living God, and you worship yourselves. And he says in verse 12 and 13, Therefore thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. For behold, he who forms the mountain and creates the wind and declares to man what is his thought, who makes the morning darkness and treads on the heights of the earth, the Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. And so here, this summons, prepare to meet your God, is to prepare for an awful confrontation. And who is going to have this confrontation with him? God Almighty. The Lord God Almighty is his name, or as ESV and some of your translations say, the Lord God of hosts. And that phrase is used over 280 times in the Old Testament, referencing God as, as a kind of military leader. And here, this... <coughs> This general is going to mount an attack against Israel. This is harsh language. Harsh language. Now listen, 
Though the language is harsh, God, God was seeking to discipline this nation in order to bring them back. It's always with a view to change. Proverbs 3, verse 11 and 12 says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, and do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. And so when God disciplines his own, he's doing so with the view of the vantage point, the aspiration, the hope that this will pull us back into relationship, that will awaken our sensitivities, awaken our conscience, reroute the brain, unsear the searing. That's God's heart, that's God's objective. Bringing us back into relationship. Now, I find the, the transferable principles here, striking, penetrating, convicting. There is so much for us to learn about this historic event that happened centuries ago at a particular juncture in Israel's history, and yet we learn so many fundamental things about God and about human nature. And I want to look at this from really two levels, because you see in chapter three, chapter three, God's saying, you had it all, and I gave you a stewardship, and I gave you truth, and it was for your good, and you walked away from it. And in chapter 4, he says, I give you worship, and worship properly understood is a response to God, and you would have none of it. And just, instead, you chose to worship yourself. It was all about what you wanted. Israel wanted what Israel wanted, rather than wanting what God wanted for them. So let's think about this on, on two levels. One, a, a personal level, as we consider our own selfish aspirations and desires. And then second, I want us to think of this a little bit more abstractly, a little bit more at an ontological level, a little bit more of a, a being level. On a personal level, the fall is so far reaching. I mean, we think of sin fundamentally as a falling short of God's standards of holiness. It is, it is failing to achieve God's standard. But the motivation is always internal. It's always about self. It's always about me. And so, Eve was deceived. But Eve wanted to be even more like a God. And she said, I'm going to do it my way. And Adam looked at his wife. And he knew what God had said. He said, I want to be with my wife. And Israel of old, they had truth. They had knowledge. They had blessings. They had revelation. They said, no, we want it our way. And that's how you and I all too often live. We choose what we want over what God wants because we fail to acknowledge that what God wants for us is always the better way. We are self-deceived if we think that our way is better still. And so here, ancient Israel at a particular junction in history said, no thanks. What does that tell you perhaps about what's lying in your own heart? But let me press this a little bit further. As we think about the ontological implications of this. What larger principles as a, are at work here? Well, here's a, I want to invite you to think about this with you. We cast off binary thinking in terms of replacing it with a kind of new oneness. This is the sin of all humanity, really. Let me take you to a passage we often cite, and we keep going to this well and finding new things. Let me take you to Romans chapter 1. And let's tease this out a little bit. Because this is describing how all how people groups, how whole nations have responded to God's truth. So in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, this is what it says. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so that they are without excuse. So to ancient Israel, God gave them the whole story, but God says here, look, every nation has enough knowledge intuitively given to them that I exist and that this is what I'm like, such that they are without excuse. But then it says this, for although they knew God, they knew he was there, they knew who he was, 
was. They knew enough about him to be accountable. Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Unteachable. Failure to see cause and effect. Failure to see long term. Wanting it their way. Claiming to be wise. They became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God, the eternal, infinite, transcendent God, who is wholly other than us, exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, he says, therefore God gave them over. God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to purity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. It's actually a definite article for the lie. As if there was, this was some sort of grander understood lie on the part of the evil one. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever. And what Israel did was they said, your truth, we want nothing of it. Worship is not about worshiping Another. It's not about worshiping, worshiping the Creator. We will worship instead ourselves. They may not have worded it or stated it that way, but it all became about themselves. And, and this, this fundamental binary thing where we see reality is two there's the Creator, and there's the created. And Romans 1 tells us that one of the fundamental sins of, of, of human beings. One of the foundations of paganism is that everything is one, not two. There's not a separate, there's not an other. What is God that God is holy? He's completely separate, he's transcendent, he's other. Yes, I know he's in, I know he's in our midst. But God is fundamentally other than us. And God has no birthday. But Israel said, no, we want to extract ourselves from any identification with God. We're not interested in this truth, and we're not interested in worship. We're interested in religious practice and religious rituals and how they'll make us feel and how they'll advance our reputation. But they extracted themselves and distanced themselves from God. And this, Peter Jones calls it oneism. This is the foundational underpinnings of things like pantheism and, and paganism and in part Hinduism and Buddhism, earth, religion, worship of nature. And Israel functioned practically like atheists. And they said, we'll live our way because we know better, and we'll worship our way and ourselves because it's quite enjoyable. And they failed to acknowledge this binary twoism that was at work, where there's a creator and the created. And they wrote God out because they had no interest. And they wanted to distance themselves from God. Whereas worship, worship properly understood is always a response, always some of a response to God. And so when God reveals, we respond. When God acts, we respond. And when God gives, when God gives, we respond. And sometimes the response in Scripture is praise and worship. But sometimes it's gratitude and thanksgiving. And sometimes it's brokenness and confession. And sometimes it's obedience and sacrifice. But that's what worship is. Worship is always a response to this eternal, infinite, holy, other, transcendent being. This holy God who's separate and distinct and, and different from us. And we're responding in wonder. Sorry, Kierkegaard said something very, I'm sure you've wrestled with this in your classes, but he gave us this wonderful model. He said, the problem with the modern church is that if you imagine this is a church setting, not just a chapel setting, God is the prompter, the pastor is the performer, the worship leader is the performer, the actor, and the church is the audience. And so what happens on the stage is to elicit excitement and interest in the part of the audience. And Kierkegaard said, this is the problem of the modern church. He said that almost 200 years ago. He said, whereas what we need to think about is this, that the pastor or worship leader is the prompter. The church are the real performers, the actors, and God is the audience. See, worship is always about the other. Worship is always ultimately about God. And all too often we make worship about ourselves. 
Because as one of the consequences of the fall, there's this oneism at work. We think it's all about us. Even the worship, it's, it's about us. And then we argue and bicker about theology, charismatic and non-charismatic, views of baptism, the Lord's Supper. And we argue about control, free-flowing or planned, informal or liturgical. We argue about style, emotion, and cerebral. And we argue about music, traditional, contemporary, if, if that even has a kind of categories anymore. And it's, it's like we, we come to worship and we say, well, you know, I like, I like my burger with provolone cheese and, and, and ketchup and mustard. Today, you put cheddar on it. What were you thinking? Miss the point. Amos is saying to us, Sister Israel, I, I, I gave you truth, God says. Through Amos, God says, I gave you truth, I gave you my identity, I gave you my will, I gave you my way for your good, for my glory. And when you follow that, life will always be the better. And when I show myself to you, the anticipated, expected aspiration that God has is that we respond in, in worship and in wonder and in gratitude and in thanksgiving and in obedience. Not making it about ourselves. So when I think of how this could apply to you and I today, the words of Amos, hundreds of years ago. I think of, what I think of our mission statement. Barakas is a community of learning that calls students, that calls us all to seek the kingdom of God. And in my simple mind, when I think of the kingdom of God in its reducible, most simple form, kingdoms have kings. We are the subjects. God is our creator. He is wholly distinct and separate and completely other than us. And he makes us in his image. But God is so very different. There's the creator and the created. And as the creator shows himself to the created, we respond by not focusing on ourselves. We respond with with wonder and worship and obedience to the King. And yes, He's our friend. And yes, He's our Savior. And yes, He's our Redeemer. And yes, He's our comfort. He's all these things. But God is holy. God is completely other than us. God is transcendent. And when God gives us glimpses of His mystery and His wonder, we're to remind ourselves afresh that he's our king, that we're subject to him. But the beauty of this benevolent king, this holy transcendent being, is that what he gives us is for our good. They looked at themselves and thought, how can we advantage ourselves? How can we advance ourselves? How can we advance our reputation? How can we make this about ourselves? The ancient sin of Romans 1. So I read this story from Amos has application to you and I today because that same blood pumps through our veins too. And you and I are just as vulnerable to that same kind of selfishness, that same kind of self-absorption, that same kind of idolatry. Father, would you keep us, would you keep us from these ancient vices of selfishness, of writing you out of our picture, even when we espouse them and give verbal acknowledgement of your existence. But Father, forgive us for practical atheism. Forgive us for when we make worship about ourselves. Help us to live in submission to the King, whose benevolent ways and wisdom are always for our good. Pray this in Jesus' name.